eat it. Uh, Tati and I want to welcome you all to our worship service. Um, hope your weekends have all been restful and good and you're ready to um, take on next week with lots of energy. And so when Tati and I were talking about this welcome, we found it funny because here we are going to welcome you all to service when just two weeks ago we had been welcomed by all of you to a brand new town brand new church, brand new everything. And so we just wanted to start and just take a quick moment to thank you all for the help and the prayers and the gifts it's really made, meant the world to us. Um, and so with that, we wanted to share a scripture and some thoughts. And so we're gonna read from Psalm 71, starting in verse 14. All right. Now, starting in verse 14, the Bible reads, As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them. All. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Tati's gonna share a little bit now. Yeah, I love this passage. It's like my all-time favorite. But I'm, I wanted us all to read that today because I love this time during the week. It's so special where all generations get to worship God together and we get to benefit from each other, from all age groups. So raise your hand if you're under 90. That should be everyone, hopefully. I mean, all are welcome. Right. What about under under 40? Anyone under 20? Yeah. All right. And I know we got kids in Kids Kingdom, but once they come back out, it's just going to be such a great time for us all to enjoy the fellowship. In what other circumstances is this normal, right? We're all in our little bubbles throughout the week. So I'm so excited to be one today with you all. Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord God, so grateful that you brought us all here tonight to turn our gaze to you, to turn our focus to you, Lord, even in how our weeks can get so busy and bustling and we come home and it can be just hard even then to keep up with all the different things we need to do outside of work, outside of homework. But God, I just pray that during this time we can really be encouraged by you, be filled by you and your spirit, Lord. Be with the lesson, help your spirit to work through it, and that we can all learn from it, God, and be with the fellowship. Your son's name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand for one more song before communion, and that's going to be number 440, Sanctuary. Communion is a time where we remember Jesus and his life and death and resurrection, and how his life, death, and resurrection has an impact on us today and every day. And uh, this song is about preparing ourselves to be a sanctuary for the Holy Spirit of God. And so to prepare ourselves for communion, we're going to sing Sanctuary.
This actually is my very, very favorite thing about going to church, is having communion mm -hmm. and sharing communion. Because, um, you know, we know we all know the word commune, right? Where it's um, when you, the verb, I should say. Um, it's when you share your thoughts and your intimacies with other people. And usually it's people you like, otherwise you wouldn't be sharing all that information, correct? True. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's a family, that's close friends, that's your spouse. And those relationships and the sharing or the communion of those relationships should always be without pretense and with no falsehood. And they should always be pure and honest and open and freely flowing. And if that isn't happening, then there's, you know, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when we pray, praying is communing with God. And so when we pray, we're to be open and honest and pure and of pure heart to God so that he can give us the strength to, you know, live another day and fight the battle. Um, because when we, communi having communion and praying is a time when we examine ourselves, right? We have to self-examine before mm -hmm. we even take communion because um, we can't be false. There can't be anything false in us. And, uh, and I love that about God's commands because um, everybody compromises. Everybody settles, right? We all, yes, I know they don't tell the truth, but what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Or yes, I know they cheated me, but I don't really want to fight it. It's not worth it. You know, it's like all these things we have to compromise on in the world, and at, quite frankly, out in the darkness. Mm -hmm. But in the light, we can't do that, mm -hmm. because God doesn't allow it, it's, you know. And so, um, because communion is a close and special relationship, and we enjoy the presence of each other and the presence of Jesus and God, um, and the Holy Spirit, it, it needs to be pure and it needs to be light. And so um, I'd like to read the scripture, um, John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I love that promise because, you know, the minute you go back to your life, there's a lot of darkness. Satan is the prince of the world. His minions run everything. It's dark out there, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's a very difficult battle every day to even just waking up, you know, it, it, it can be difficult for a lot of people. And so I love that Jesus says that he's the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And I like that because it's a promise 
that there's no fault in it. There's, not, there's nothing but what he says. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of us as Christians, sometimes people walk the line and they walk those gray areas. And we know that's not truth. We know that's not light. And so, um, you know, we have to, our fortitude needs to be strong mm -hmm. in order for us to stay in the light. Um, another scripture that I'd like to read is, all right, how does this phone thing work? I'm sorry. John 8, 12. I just read that. So 1 John 1, 7. Okay. Here we go. 1 John. I'm sorry. Want me to read it for you? <laughs> sure. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. So that's the benefit of being in the light, that we have fellowship with one another. And not just the people in this room, but people around the world who that's believe right. as mm -hmm. we do. And um, as an example of that, it was great to see Tatiana's mother last week, mm -hmm. because I haven't seen that woman in probably 33 years. Mm. Wow. And yet, as soon as I saw her, and she saw me, it was like, oh my gosh. Because, you know, we know each other. We, we love each other. We're, we had a relationship back in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and now here we are in like nowhere land. <laughs> and here she, she was, you know, it was just so great. And so for me, well, okay, I'm sorry I called it no one land, but you know what I mean. I'm from New York City, I'm from the, from the New okay. Jersey. And there aren't as many people here as there are. Yeah, west of the Hudson, yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly. So anyway, I, uh, I just appreciate that so much, and I've been thinking so much on it all week, because I just realized, like, all right, I know, that's God, that's God blessing me. God gave me and her, like, a little hug, you know, like, here you go, you guys. You know, you can see each other for a minute. And, and it was just so, uh, it was just so encouraging. And I love it. Um, so one more scripture I would like to read. And I'd like to end with this because it is, to me, one of my favorites. And, um, and I think on it and pray on it and meditate on it quite frequently throughout my life. So it's the second Samuel 22, 31. And it says, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. Mm -hmm. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God, God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. And this helps me every day to go out there and deal you know, because there's a lot of dealing, and there's a lot of stuff, and especially like when I was working, there was a lot of stuff, and I really struggled. But then I would remember this, it's God, God who arms me with strength. And so if I prayed and, you know, meditated on his word and just focused on the spiritual and not the worldly, and if I focused on the light instead of the dark, everything went so much better. Excuse me, and so I would like to encourage everyone to consider this and remember this and during communion to really commune with God and open yourself up to the power that God gives us and the light that we walk in and to stay in that light. Yeah. So God bless you all. Thank God you. Bless you. Amen. Why don't we say a prayer uh, for communion? Uh, Father, thank you so much for Fran sharing his thoughts and scriptures mm -hmm. with us. And Pray that we can commune with one another and especially with you and your spirit and your son as we take the elements as a reminder of Jesus' body and his blood that was spilled for us. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 So as we transition from communion to diving into scripture. I would like, uh, first of all, just to remind you that we're studying through the idea of being messy. Um, being a messy people, having messy relationships, 
and therefore creating a messy community. And as Rob and a couple others have pointed out, the slides today are really bright uh, because it's just kind of that way in a messy community. It's bright and colorful and crazy and just messy. And the, the first sermon we talked about how we as individuals are, we're just a mess. And the sooner we admit it, uh, the, the sooner we bring things out into the light, just as Fran was talking about in communion, the sooner Jesus and his Holy Spirit and the disciples in our lives can help us repent and grow and change and transform. Uh, but because we're messy and we accept the fact that we're messy, we're also called to accept the fact that the, our brothers and sisters are messy. And therefore, we're going to have messy relationships and complex relationships, which is what we talked about last week. But because Jesus accepts a messy relationship with us and pursues a messy relationship with us, just like he did with the older son and the younger son in Luke 15, just as we talked about last week, we too can not only pursue a relationship with Jesus in return, but we can pursue messy relationships with each other and be accepting of each other. And as we do that, as messy individuals building messy relationships, we build a community. And because we're in it, it's a mess. But I want you to try and remember the first time you came to church, the first time you stepped into, let's say, our fellowship of churches. What was your experience like? What did you notice? What did you, and some of you have grown up in our fellowship of churches. Some of you have come into it later on in life, such as myself. But what was that experience like the first time you stepped into our fellowship of churches. Maybe get there early so you can do some adult coloring books over there in the corner and then stay for a meal afterwards, for instance, hypothetically. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, there's not that sort of happy, like, I'm good. And how are you? And just as long as you don't ask me any more questions, we're good. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Now, the purpose of this little exercise is not to try and prove how our fellowship is better than any other fellowship. That's not the point. Uh, it is a great reminder that a healthy culture goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And if you can build a healthy culture in a faith community, man, it should be warm and inviting and huggy and people will invite you to their house randomly and you might do some coloring books and people should know scripture and dive into it and ask hard questions. But even so, we're messy, right? Like we are a messy church. It's great to be a part of a healthy, you know, culture and, and, and faith growing and building. But in spite of that, we're still messy. But imagine this, the first time you came into a church, if you notice that everybody was divided racially and, and they sat in their own little pockets. And then you realize not only were there racial and ethnic divisions, there was also class and socioeconomic divisions. And the wealthy people sat in the front and they were very proud to sit in the front. And the poorer people sat in the back. And so there was social and economic stratification. And then you notice that during the potluck after service, uh, some people started eating and were kind of gorging themselves and were even getting drunk and other people didn't have anything to eat and they were kind of left outside hungry and in the cold sometimes literally and then somebody got up to preach and there was people talking and disagreeing and debating at the same time while somebody was sharing the scripture of God and it was really distracting and then there were people during the potluck who were eating food that was sacrificed to idols and they were bragging about how they had the right to do that and I don't care if your faith isn't good enough my faith is good enough to do this and and then you hear a rumor in the fellowship that there's a morality in the church but not just immorality, like weird, disgusting immorality in the church. That's what it would have been like to step into the church in Corinth in the first century. These are not hypotheticals. That actually happened. Corinth was a messy city, and they, they had a messy church. Now, the great thing they had going for them was they were disciples of Jesus, and they were in community and so they allowed someone like Paul to come in and correct, rebuke, and encourage them. 
And so there was a second letter, and maybe even a third letter that we don't have access to. But there were multiple attempts to get this church, this really messy church, pointed in the right direction. And it seems like by the time Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, there was, there was huge transformation because, because he doesn't deal any longer with immorality in the church. He says, good job dealing with it. And he doesn't deal with the racial and ethnic and socioeconomic divisions. He says, you figured out a way to be unified. And, and, and so whatever issues we might have, I, I think if we're going to compare ourselves to another fellowship, uh, you know, at least we're not like the church in Corinth. At least it ain't that bad. Um, so as I always like to, to do, and I, I think that, that anybody who gets up here and speaks does, we try to put scripture into context, not only context with the rest of scripture in the Bible, but historical context. And so uh, I want to talk just for a moment about the city of Corinth. This is, um, this is a picture of the ruins um, uh, of, of one of the temples there in Corinth. And um, it was an ancient city, and uh, it was sort of on the west end of the isthmus that separated Peloponnesia and Greece, okay? Um, in around 46 BC, Julius Caesar sent a mixed group of Italians and Greeks to go repopulate the city because it had been on the decline for years and years, and so they weren't from there, they weren't native, it was just sort of a conglomerate, a melting pot of people that he sent there because that was a strategic location as far as trade. And so they basically just repopulate the city with a bunch of people and it became sort of a melting pot. And there were lots of challenges with that. If you think about that area of the world, uh, not only was the city made up of lots of different people, but it's sort of a confluence of lots of different cultures. Uh, Europe and Eastern Europe and Western Europe and then the Middle East and Asia and even Africa as you start to think about trade routes and, and all of those cultures and people were represented in the city of Corinth. During the apostolic period there was somewhere around 700,000 people who were citizens of the city so this is a major metropolitan city as you can tell from some of the ruins. Uh, the slave to free ratio was about 70% to 30%. So 70% of the population were enslaved people. Uh, and, and it's not exactly the same as when we think of like, for instance, the North American um, slavery and the, the transatlantic slave trade. It's not exactly that, but still it wasn't a great thing to be a slave uh, in, in the Roman Empire. Uh, maybe not quite as brutal as what we think of, but, it, but still, not a great thing. You didn't have agency for yourself. And yet, this city was a centerpiece of the Roman Empire. There was a, a cult in, in the city of Corinth around worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of, of love and sex and beauty and fertility. And uh, so, so people identified with all of those characteristics of Aphrodite. And so I give you all of that information just as a little bit of context of why there were so many issues going on in the church there. It was a messy, messy situation. Now the good thing they had going for them was they were in community, messy community, but they were in community, they were disciples of Jesus, and even in spite of all the sin, they persevered and continued to strive for repentance, living in the light and growth in those messy relationships. But thinking about the city of Corinth, and the letter of 1 Corinthians, maybe this is the most similar to what we experience in America, our sort of melting pot of different cultures and peoples and all of the challenges and all of the great things that come with all of that. And so I think there's a lot that we could relate to. Now, before we move on and dive into uh, scripture here, and I'd love to in just a few minutes have some different people read small sections of 1 Corinthians, I wanna remind us of why we're talking about being messy people. And it's because th this is the first passage that we read three Sundays ago as we introduced this idea of messy people. Uh, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Jesus is saying that once we acknowledge our need, and there's an internal perceived need for Jesus, that's when we really would pursue him and have access to him. But if we have no perceived need for Jesus, and we think we don't need a doctor, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make a visit. 
And so the sooner we can admit we need Jesus because we're messy people and we're building messy relationships in a messy faith community, man, the, the sooner we're going to have just full access to all of the gifts and blessings that come from pursuing a relationship with Jesus. So we are a messy church. Can I have somebody read just 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3, please? Go for it, Abigail. Thanks for volunteering. Paul called to, to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosius. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so there's, thank you by the way, there's, um, there's this acknowledgement that Hey, you're a mess, and I'm about to get into how you're a mess, but you know what? You're sanctified in Christ Jesus. You're saints. And I love that he starts out by affirming this really messy church. They are saved, and they are considered saints of God. And I think if we think about ourselves and all of our mess, which is probably nothing compared to what we read in the Corinthian church, but I think the same affirmation is for us. We are sanctified in Jesus and we're considered saints of God. What a blessing that that's a part of our identity. And I hope that you can feel that that is a blessing and a part of your identity, that you live, no matter how you feel on any given moment, you live sanctified and saved and as a saint. That's how Paul starts this letter. There's also... Um, in, in a few verses, there's going to be the acknowledgement that this can't be a perfectly clean church and a perfectly clean congregation because it's made up of, um, uh, of messy people. And, and that's just how it is. And it's complex. And uh, sometimes the directions that Paul is going to give to them and therefore for us, they don't make sense logically. If it were a clean, perfect congregation with a bunch of clean, perfect people, the things that he's about to tell them and therefore us don't really make a whole lot of sense. But because we're a mess and yet we're sanctified and we're saints, the things that we're going to read in just a few moments make total sense. Now, again, I want to I want to talk a little bit about context. And there's probably at least a few people in here who could do a better job of teaching uh, some of the rhetorical statements that we're going to read here in a moment than I could. But I'm the one doing it. So. You're going to have to deal with it. Um, let's read this section uh, 10 through 12. Can I have somebody read chapter 1, 10 through 12? Okay. Great. Thank you, Tati. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Great, thank you. Okay, so this section right here is exemplary of um, what's called a chiasm. And we've talked about this, uh, and, and so probably it's not a total new word for everybody here, but it's where the first line and the last line are related and then the next line the second line and the second to last line are related and so on and so on until you get the very middle statement and that middle statement is really what the whole paragraph is about so when we tell a story or write a paragraph the way that we do it usually is we have like a thesis statement at the beginning of a paragraph i'm going to talk about this in the paragraph and then we talk about that thing and then we have a, a summation we have a sort of an ending and, and usually we sort of, in a story, we would write to the crescendo at the very end and then a little bit of a conclusion. That's not how Paul writes here, and that was not the rhetorical style of writing and telling stories uh, at this time in the first century. They would use chiastic rhetorical method, which is just a big way to say the first and last are related, and the next are related, and the next. And then you really get the meat of what he's saying right there in the middle. And I have a slide in a few minutes that's going to illustrate it, just in case my little hand motions aren't doing it for you, okay? Uh, so, verse 10 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there would be no divisions. 
And the last line is, what I'm saying is, one of you says, I belong to Paul, and I belong to Apollos, and I belong to Cephas, and I belong to Christ. But Christ is not divided. So that's how they're related. The next line is that you be united in the same understanding and same conviction. And then right there in the middle, verse 11, those, that, that whole sentence there, for it's been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's household, that there is rivalry among you. And so that's the part that he really wants to bring to the surface. Like how, he's saying how in God's family, where we're all brothers and sisters and there should be no divisions, is there a rivalry in the church? Well, the answer is it's messy. It's a messy church. And he's trying to remind the people that Paul or Apollos or Cephas were not we're not crucified for them. And this, this table is just sort of a, an illustration of the differences that they would have felt and seen in their various leaders, all right? And I know that we would never do this today, but what they were doing was aligning themselves in a bigger church with the leaders who were the most like them and talked the, the way that they wanted to hear. And you might think about what Paul tells Timothy later on about how people gather around them, what their itching ears want to hear. Maybe we do do that today. Uh, but, but these are sort of the, the ways that they would have felt. So Paul, he was Jewish, but he had Roman citizenry, and he was classically trained in Roman and Greek rhetoric and literature. Um, uh, he was uh, Roman by birthright, so he, he was uh, a citizen there, and he was highly educated. And so the, the culture would have been food and patronage and grace and uh, then you, you see Paul, Apollos, who was more like a teacher and a dy dynamic speaker, and he was Greek, and we know that because Apollos is a Greek name, uh, and he was more highly educated in, in the Greek way and, and, and Greek rhetoric and knowledge. And then Cephas, who was very Jewish, uh, Peter is a, the, the Greek version of Cephas, he was more representing the outcasts and the minorities and would have kept kosher and held to the, the Torah. And then in, in the church in Corinth, the folks who were like, I follow Christ, were more sort of the spiritualists and maybe the Gnostics. And so they weren't so interested in what these other people had to say. They just wanted to follow Jesus. But it was not the biblical version of Jesus. It was a, like a super spiritualized sort of mystic version of Jesus. And they considered themselves the true believers. And, and so they were sort of elitist. Okay, so this is the different divisions that Paul is talking about. Um, here's how it might relate to us. So Paul, who was of Roman citizenry, maybe represented wealth and power. Apollos, who was Greek, maybe represented knowledge and art and expression. Cephas, who was Jewish. Peter, who was Jewish. Uh, maybe he was like the guardian of, of, of history, represented the guardians of history, and was a traditionalist, okay? He would have been like a, an a cappella only sort of a guy. Um, and then, you know, in, in this context, Christ, those were the folks who were sort of mystic and they bounced around everywhere and they thought they were sort of special and elite. Okay, so those are the divisions that Paul is trying to deal with here in the church. The reason all those divisions exist in the church is because those divisions already existed in their society and in their city. And so they brought their mess into the church and Paul is forcing them to address their mess and bring it out into the light so that it can dealt, get dealt with, so that it can be dealt with. Uh, we too are a messy church and I don't think we're nearly as bad as the church in Corinth, although I wanna be careful to compare because I don't think that's really what it's about. But we can believe that Ah, if everybody in our church was just like me, we'd be good, right? Or if they just thought like me or talked like me or had the political views that I hold to, we'd be better. Or if everybody would just kind of do what I do, the church would grow. Uh, or if, if people just thought the way and felt the way and acted the way that I do. We, we sort of make ourselves uh, the, the thing to compare against rather than Jesus. And when we do that, we're making a religion kind of in our own image rather than a religion that's based in Jesus' image. And the truth is, if we were all the same one, this would be a super boring church, right? Like, we would all think the same and act the same and talk the same. And it would be really boring. 
uh, and none of us want that. But the fact that we're different makes us stronger because we all bring our lenses and experiences to Jesus and let Jesus redefine what it means to be a follower. It's not just what we think, although we share a lot about what we think and react and how scripture hits us. That's really healthy, I think, because we're, we're sharing and reading scripture in community, but we also have the capacity in community to correct and teach and rebuke one another. And, and that's really good in a diverse setting to be able to do that because we all have blind spots and we all have sort of a, our narrow experience. And so the fact that we're a messy church with people from all backgrounds is so good and necessary. And we need to continue to lean into that as we grow. There's no perfect book series or sermon series that's going to just you know, be, be sort of the capstone and make it just right. There's just not, there's no structure that is going to perfect the church and make it really clean so that it's not messy. There's, there's just not. There's no organizational chart uh, or level of accountability. Uh, it, it's just not because we're all messy people and it's designed that way. It's designed that way. We, we live by faith, meaning we don't, we don't always see where it is that we're going, but we follow the voice of Jesus through the mess, right? That's, that's I think, the whole point of this thing. So how do we live in the mess? That's what we'll talk about for the remainder of our time. Can I have somebody read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12? You got it. Great. 7 to 12 or 10? 7 to 10. Sorry. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Great. So at this point, I want to recommend a book that I have a copy of at home. If you want to borrow it, you can borrow it. Uh, it's by Kenneth Bailey, and it's called Paul Through Mediterranean Eyes, and it's a fantastic book. So you could read this just on the surface without knowing any Greek or without knowing what a chiasm is, and you can get a lot from what we just read, right? You do not have to be a scholar to read the Bible at face value and allow the Holy Spirit to reform you. You, you don't. But the more we can pack on context and history and rhetorical style, the more we can understand. It's kind of like when we read it just on the surface, it's the tip of the iceberg. And you can get a lot from the tip of the iceberg. But scripture is so interesting and so complex and sometimes so messy that the more you get under the surface, the more you can appreciate the beauty of the word of God. And that's what's going on right here. Um, so this, what, what Spencer just read, is also a chiasm. And here's a bit of an illustration. Okay, so verse 7. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wis wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That last stanza, that last sentence is the, the center of the chiasm. So, this paragraph is all about the cross. It's all about Jesus' crucifixion. That's the middle of the paragraph. And then the next line. But, as it was written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And so it starts with God's wisdom, and ends with God's wisdom. Next is God's decree and command, and then what God prepared. And then the next one is we didn't understand, and we didn't understand, and then in the middle is the cross. Now God's wisdom outside of scripture and our faith community doesn't make sense. 
it seems like foolishness. The cross seems like foolishness to the world. Why would the king of all everything be sacrificed on this torture device? And it makes no sense. But to us, the cross and Jesus' death and burial and resurrection is the power of God. Because it didn't just happen to Jesus one time. It happens for all of us. That we, as we pursue Jesus and we experience Jesus' death and burial and resurrection on the cross through, through baptism, as we're baptized into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we're raised up new creations. We also get to live a new life. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6 as he describes our conversion process of going from dark to light. And that seems foolish to the world. But to us, it's the power of God. And if we ever get away from a religion that's centered on the cross, we essentially just become self-reliant. We start to rely on structure, maybe, or a sermon series, or a book, and none of those things are inherently wrong, and actually those things can be really, really good in the right context. But our religion has to be focused on the, the capstone of our religion has to be the cross of Jesus Christ and how his death and burial and resurrection impacts us every day. That's why we take communion every week to remind ourselves and to take a special moment to remind ourselves that our religion is built around Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. And it's a mystery and it makes no sense except when you start to experience it for yourself. Except when you start to experience a death and burial and resurrection and repentance. And really it's this religion, Christianity is, it's centered on the cross and it's about relationships, a relationship with God. And God's decree, he prepared the cross for us, a messy church. God predestined before the ages of glory that's the first line. And when we can equally sit at the foot of the cross and remind ourselves that we're all equal at the foot of the cross, there's no division. There, how can you have an ego when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus who died for us? How can you think about, well, their politics are different than mine, or they look different than me? Or, there's just no room for, for ego and division when we humble ourselves. And we can sit at the foot of the cross, staring at Jesus. Can I have somebody read Revelation 7, 9 through 10? Revelation 7, 9 through 10. Thank you. Seven, verse 9. Mm-hmm. And 10. Good. All right. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the land. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Great. Thank you. This is um, actually what we sang about. It's the same sort of throne room vision that we sang about when we sang holy, holy, holy. And it's vast multitudes. This is people from all backgrounds and all times from all over the world simply praising, praising Jesus. And, and that's what it's like in heaven. And Jesus told us to, to actually pray that God's will would be done on earth in the same way that it's done in heaven. And so it makes sense that we're in a messy church. It makes sense that our church looks the way that it does right now because this is intentional on God's part. He's, he's building a church for himself, a, a vast multitude of people from all nations and all backgrounds. And so as we go about our days thinking about, well, am I going to make a choice today to hoard all of my blessings or to share my blessings? Am I going to make a choice today to just personalize my faith or to share my faith in communion, as, as Fran was talking about earlier. Uh, as we think about how we want the church to grow and what we're going to do to help bring more and more folks into the church, I think we've got to, one, admit, you know what, it's always going to be messy. 
And this is not a country club where we have to make sure people will fit the bill before we can let them in. It's just not, it is not that. But two, we need to be intentional about being a place where everybody from all backgrounds can feel welcome. And to do that, we've gotta, we've gotta make an effort to bring in people from all backgrounds and kind of from all nations into the church. That's the only way that we can achieve what we see in Revelation. And whatever structure that we do, whatever sermon series we do, all of this is really just meant to point us back to Jesus. All of this stuff, really the point of everything that we do is we worship and take communion and, and read scripture is to, to point us all back to Jesus. And so our systems should, should help us be more dependent on God, not more dependent on a system, right? Yeah. Our hierarchy and structure or whatever, our sermon series should make us more dependent on God, not dependent on a person who teaches in a way that we can appreciate. Uh, not that there's anything inherently wrong with that, obviously, but the point is to help us more dependent, be more dependent on Jesus. And so I want to ask us, and this is a rhetorical question, meaning you don't have to answer right now. I want, I want us to think about this as we go tonight, and, uh, as, as you go throughout your day, every day this coming week. Uh, these are the things that I like for us to think about. The way that you structure your life and your devotion to God and your quiet times or morning devotionals and the way that you structure your discipling times or your one another relationships and the way that you think about your attendance to Bible talk and to family group and to midweek and all of the things, the way that you think about and experience your religion, is it helping you see Jesus more clearly? And are you helping other people see Jesus more clearly? Or in other words, are you sharing the good news with your life? Are you producing good works with your life? Is your home a place of peace and hospitality? These are all the things that would come as fruit if we're dependent on Jesus and thinking about how to see him clearly every day. And so as we close, uh, you know, it's a great thing that we're a messy church because that's how God designed it. And we can accept ourselves, we can accept one another, and we can accept the mess because that's how God designed it. And it's a beautiful mess. And there's lots of bright colors and it's fun to be around. And I hope that th that, that is your experience uh, as you worship together with all of us. I hope that you can appreciate the mess and the imperfections and the imperfect people because you're one of them and so am I. And, and it's, it, we're all welcome here by design. So why don't we close in a prayer uh, and then we have a few announcements. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us in the mess and calling us into the mess and showing us Jesus in the messiness of our lives. And I pray that uh, rather than trying to avoid hardship or suffering or mess, that we can lean into it and that we can see you more clearly in all of it. And God, I, I pray that that anything that's going on in our lives, hardships or blessing, would really point us back to Jesus and help us to follow him more closely. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, as we close out here, just a couple of announcements. Uh, the Crankle family group is going to have a meeting right over here, right after, uh, by request of, of Henry. So you will call off guard. You don't have to do anything. Henry wanted to do that. So uh, right over here, right after service. This coming midweek is going to be combined midweek, right back here at 7 p.m. Um, the Malcolm family group, our family group, will be hosting the potluck for next Sunday. We don't have a potluck this Sunday. We do it every other. And so uh, Malcolm family group on Wednesday night, we're going to come up with a plan. Okay, so be ready with some ideas. And it's going to be awesome, whatever it is. So get ready and come to church next week hungry. And then finally, uh, the alumni weekend is coming up. Uh, and Lauren sent out an email with all, so, so please check your email for all the details, and uh, it should be a whole lot of fun. I believe the dates on that are the, the 6th through the 8th, is that right? Anybody remember? She's uh, not here to correct me on this. 17th. Okay, yeah. say it again. The 15th through the 17th. Okay, that sounds right. Thank you, Frank. Uh, check your emails for specifics there, but we're going to have a lot of people back in town to just sort of celebrate the, the 15th anniversary of this church and also um, the alumni weekend. So that'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Anybody have any closing announcements? Campus ministry on Friday. We're doing manhunt. Um, check the group name for more information, but it will be after sundown.
Great. Okay. And there's Bible Talks Tuesday and Thursday. Yep, right? Bible Talks Tuesday, Thursday, 6.30. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, that's all we have. We're dismissed. Go in peace and in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, Craig.